Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Caper from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. We're continuing our uh, call in worship from uh, uh, COVID 19. Uh, with, I'm going to mention the good news that next Sunday we're going to be back in our sanctuary on June 21st. Um, but we're going to continue a dial in option for those uh, who, who need or just want that. Um, it's been great to uh, have people viewing on YouTube as well as people uh, dialing in and uh, uh, in person will be one more way to connect and uh, we look forward to that starting uh, next week. Um, we're continuing our series in Philippians. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 2 verses 12 to 18. Uh, verse 12 begins with a therefore, which means that it uh, is connecting the preceding text with the verses to follow. Um, now what came before, I'll remind you, is the, the famous, famous Christ hymn in Philippians 2, describing how in Christ God emptied himself, taking the form of a slave um, and becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross for our sake. Um, so what follows is uh, the discussion of how to live as people redeemed by Christ. And here's verses 12 to 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Those are Paul's words we're reading today. Here are just a few of the most obvious connections between the Christ hymn and those verses. First of all, Christ obeyed God as a slave. And the church in the city of Philippi obeyed God through the voice of Paul and his words. Second, it took great effort for Christ to be faithful to God and to sacrifice for our benefit. And the church in Philippi must expend great effort as they work out their salvation with fear and with trembling. This doesn't mean, by the way, that their salvation, whether they will go to heaven or not, is in question. It means that living out the implications of that salvation is a lifelong project that is very hard work. That kind of work might tend to make one irritable, which is why Paul cautions them in verse 14 to do everything without grumbling or arguing. This is the case even if it feels like everything is really bad. Remember that Paul is in prison as he writes this, and that, of course, is a stressful experience. He says that he's being poured out like a drink offering. I'm not sure I completely understand the metaphor, but it makes me think about feeling very weak and vulnerable, as if my bones were liquid, and it sounds very unpleasant. But the service and the sacrifice are worth it. Paul says that he will be able to boast on the day of Christ that he did not run the race in vain. He will be glad and rejoice, and the church can be glad and rejoice with him. So what is going on here is that a theological truth has been stated about the work, mission, and glory of Christ. Then Paul has talked about how his personal crisis, his personal biography, relates to that theological truth. And he ties that in with the experience of the church at Philippi. For the rest of this sermon, I want to replace some of those ingredients. Of course, I'm going to keep Christ at the center of the mix, just as Paul did. 
but I'm not writing to the church in Philippi 2,000 years ago. I'm speaking to the church in Elmwood Park in New Jersey in the USA and all our associated friends on the internet. And I'm not in prison, so I need to speak about some other situation that stresses me out. And the one that is catching my attention this week is clergy misconduct. I know that comes out of left field. It uh, hasn't been in the news lately, thank God. Um, but it has been on my mind this week. I've been reading the autobiography of uh, writer J. Michael Straczynski. He describes uh, his horrific upbringing in an abusive home where his manipulative alcoholic father routinely beat the rest of the family. At around age 18, he got invited to uh, kind of a revival coffee house at a Baptist church and he accepted Christ. And uh, this large church uh, actually had houses where people would live together in intentional Christian community in small groups. Uh, well, this was wonderful for him. He could escape the abusive home life and live together with other Christians. Uh, that went on for some months until he came home early one day and found the head pastor having sex with someone he was supposedly counseling. Um, feeling badly about the situation, uh, he went to uh, one of the church elders to report what he had seen. The elders instead accused him of lying and that he had, quote, a spirit of rebellion and threw him out with uh, nowhere to go but back to his abusive family, which they did know about. Straczynski lost his faith and has never practiced Christianity or any other religion since. I tell this story because I happened to run across it this week and it is about a writer whose work I admire. But that isn't the point. The point is that because that church in the early 70s refused to discipline its pastor, a lot more people suffered abuse and heartache and probably most of them lost their faith too. And of course, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Many Protestant pastors and lay leaders have used their authority for sexual abuse and misconduct. And over the last 25 years or so, the enormous problem of child abuse by Catholic priests has become known. And it was enabled by systemic structures that protected the wrongdoers and kept putting them in positions where they could repeat their offenses. And here is where we come to the point where I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Remember, I'm not worried about whether I will go to heaven. I am confident in the promises of Christ my Savior for that. But my experience of the faith is that the longer I am in it, the softer and more loving my heart grows. I believe that the word of God challenged, me, channeled through the Holy Spirit transforms us and makes us into better people. As Deuteronomy 30.14 says, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. So how is it that there are all these clergy who spend time with the word and presumably in prayer and lead God's people in worship, and yet their hearts are not transformed and they do not obey the word and they actually harm even the children of their flocks? I just do not understand it at any level. It makes me angry and hurt. It makes me ashamed. That's where the fear and trembling from verse 13 come in. I think about that a lot. It's very discouraging to me that such things can happen in and around the Church of Christ. Moreover, even though I haven't participated in their behavior, I feel tainted by it. Indeed, polling data strongly indicates that the reputation of my entire profession has severely suffered. Clergy used to be held in much, much higher regard than we are today when the phrase pedophile priest is a cliched trope. I haven't done anything wrong, and yet my reputation is damaged because of the actions of others. And that puts me in exactly the same position as all the good police officers out there. Some very sizable minority of police in this country have acted rashly, unjustly, violently, criminally, especially toward people of color. 
It isn't all police, but it isn't just one or two either. And it keeps happening. When the police are sent in to contain protests, violence seems to escalate rather than decline. And just this weekend, another black man was running away and was shot in the back and died. Rayhard Brooks in Atlanta. When people talk about systemic reform, even radical reform involving the redistribution of funds out of police departments to other kinds of services. The reason those movements are building so much momentum is not because all police are racist, they aren't. The reason is that the minority who are racists and who do act wrongly is a large number. And because the systems which chain, train police and maintain their positions are enabling this behavior just as the Catholic hierarchy enabled the minority of priests who were abusive for decade after decade. Firing the bad actors isn't enough. Genuine deep reform of the system is required. By the way, one of the reasons our Presbyterian scandals have been of a much lesser order than the Catholic ones is that we have benefited from the voices of women in leadership. That diversity let us put precautions in place that have helped protect vulnerable people, and we can be proud of that, at least. A sense of this parallel between police and clergy has been growing in me over the last few days. This week, it will be a focus of my prayer life to pray for good police officers, that they will have the strength to stand up to bad actors in the system and bear up under the enormous strain of trying to do the right thing. Just like us, they also need to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, trusting in God who will work through them in order to fulfill God's good purpose. May they, in Paul's words, be blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And remembering the Christ who became human to serve us, May we all shine like the stars in the sky as we hold firmly to the word of life so that we will be able to boast on the day of Christ that we did not run or labor in vain. Amen. Many blessings to you all.